Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Um, we've just started our summer webinar series webinar called Teaching Students with Dyslexia the Basics. And we have as our moderators, co-moderators, Dr. Amber Brown and Dr. Peggy Simmingson. Um, our emails are in the chat and Dr. Brown is, has updated hers. Hers is yes. amber.brown at uta.edu, is that right? Yes. Okay, awesome. And mine is in the chat area as well. It's peggys at uta.edu. Um, you can also probably just look us up online on the UTA website. Our information as well as is on the Google ha um, handout. I'm going to type that in the chat window for everyone one more time and feel free to share that. So everyone type in the chat window, what do you hope to learn about in the webinar or why you're attending? So go ahead and take about 20 seconds to type. It can be a word or a phrase. It doesn't necessarily have to be a whole sentence or paragraph. So take a minute to type what you hope to learn about in this webinar today, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions. We chose, while you're typing, I'll just say we chose this topic because many teachers um, struggle with, with things that they can do in the classroom on a day-to-day week-to-week -week basis. So I see somebody wrote strategies, exactly, and we'll talk about strategies too. We're not going to be able to cover everything in here, and that's why we're providing lots of resources for you to read and learn about on your own. And Ali says how to help students in the, this, who ha have dyslexia in the math classroom. Great. So content areas, how to help students. Okay, thanks everyone for typing that. Let's get started. Remember, these are, are our opinions and suggestions. They don't necessarily reflect the views of UT Arlington. We want to support you, respect your ideas and needs, um, dialogue, and then share. So as part of this project, the Teacher Induction Project, we want to build digital community for alumni and current students, as well as new teachers that are beyond UT Arlington out there in our global community. So we make them open access, mobile access. I see um, four people have joined by mobile devices. So um, let's see. So we'll keep going. Web 2.0, that means interactive, where we post things on Facebook, Twitter, and we have now a slide share channel where we'll be posting these PowerPoints. So check that out. And we have real world advice for teachers. The recordings are, will be available on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and again on the slide share where we'll post just the PowerPoint portion. And again, we'll also post links to recording and multimedia on our Google Doc that accompanies this webinar. It's tinyurl.com slash dyslexia webinar. Ask questions in the chat window. Our main Q&A is at the end. We recommend you jot down a few ideas. Again, use the chat window often and we'll check through it. Go ahead and type in the chat window where you're from. And if you want, you can use the pen tool, which is the third box down on that skinny bar next to the chat window. And tell us where you're from. Tell us where you're located at the moment. So let's see where people are at. We've got Fort Worth, Arlington, Arlington. OK, good. Thanks for letting us know. Cedar Hill, Roanoke, lots of people from the Metroplex. OK, great. Thank you for joining us. Let's do a poll. The polling option is next to the hand tool right above the names in the participants window. So if you find the drop down arrow, you'll see A, B, C, D, and E, and use that drop down arrow next to the hand and go ahead and vote. Are you currently A, a pre-service teacher, maybe at UTA or somewhere else, B, first through third year teacher, an UTA graduate, C, first through third year teacher, a non-UTA graduate, or D, a fourth or more year teacher, or E, faculty, or none, or none of the above. And I need to vote as well, so we'll all vote. So the voting tool is next to the hand tool, and it lets us get a snapshot of who's here today. About five more seconds to vote. Okay. 
and some of you put it in the chat in the chat window, and that's great too. Okay, so we've got kind of a mix. So we've got some pre-service teachers, and we've got faculty or none, and then we've got kind of a mix too from what we see in the chat window. So thank you. Here's our agenda. Definitions. What is dyslexia? Diagnosing dyslexia. How do we know? What are the symptoms? How do we know they're not just struggling a little bit? What is what are the characteristics that we can look for as a classroom teacher or a specialist? Um, instructional strategies. So once a student is diagnosed as having dyslexia, what can we do to help them as they are faced with, you know, lots of reading and writing in the classroom? What do we do to help support? What kind of modifications can we make to the curriculum? What kinds of intervention programs work? All these questions and more we'll touch on today. Some terms to know, and most importantly, resources for you to take away with you so you can continue your learning. We want it to be interactive, so type in the chat window. Another objective is for you to be able to identify some signs of dyslexia. We'll cover some of them. Learn about diagnosis. Dis be able to describe some instructional strategies to someone else, and then use those instructional strategies and learn about resources. So a little bit about myself, I'll be presenting today. So I was a former bilingual and ESL teacher in California and Texas for eight years and all in elementary settings. Um, I did have two summers of high school English teaching as well. That was interesting and quite a contrast to the elementary grades. But I definitely am an, an, am an elementary oriented person. Um, I have a PhD in language and literacy from UT Austin. Uh, this is going on my seventh year as a associate professor at UT Arlington, and I'm in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Okay, let's get started. One of the most basic resources we use here in Texas um, is called the Dyslexia Handbook. Uh, go ahead and type yes or no in the chat window if you've heard of the Dyslexia Handbook or you're familiar with it even a little bit familiar, like if you've heard of the title. You can do the green check or the red X in the voting um, booth, or you can type in the chat window yes or no or kind of. So we have some no's. OK, this is a key resource. And I'm going to put the link in the chat window to the currently approved version. We're in limbo. Things change. And so there's a 2014 version on the right. It says draft in big letters. I learned on Twitter that it has actually been approved by the State Board of Education, and they'll be adding a few things. But if you look at the 2014 version, it'll be more or less the same thing as what the final approved version will look like. I recommend reading this book. I actually recommend reading this handbook you know, word for word, not just a skim, because it covers three key areas. It covers, well, it probably covers four. The definition of dyslexia. It also covers diagnosis, so what you need to know about diagnosing dyslexia. It also covers instructional components, including not just classroom ideas, but how to involve parents and families. And then fourth, and maybe most importantly, it covers the law. So what are the legal issues that are pertaining to dyslexia and students with dyslexia? It's really a key document, so I want to point that out up front. And I want to say a lot of our ideas in here come straight from the Dyslexia Handbook. It's your go-to source. And you'll notice it was created by Region 10 in consultation with others. Region 10 is actually here in the Metroplex, interestingly. Um, also in the Metroplex is another great resource. Um, and Dr. Brown, um, chime in here if you would like, too, about this hospital. The Scottish Rite Hospital is in Oak Lawn in Dallas, near downtown Dallas. And they have come up with some great, um, not just philanthropy to help people with dyslexia and families and children, and they've come up with some intervention programs to help students and families. And so their resources here, we went, um, five of us went to a workshop sponsored by them. Dr. Brown, do you want to mention anything um, else? I was just going to mention that as a, you know, as a parent, I know sometimes you have to advocate for your children, and this is a great resource to have because as you're advocating for your child, if the school seems a little unwilling um, to do a diagnosis because they don't 
think um, maybe the symptoms um, aren't severe enough and they're not impeding their ability as, as profoundly as the school needs for them to do a diagnosis, you can refer parents to Scottish Rite and they, as a nonprofit, can maybe provide some resources and interventions that may not be available through the schools if an official diagnosis hasn't been made. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That's good information. Um, so yeah, the diagnosis is done through the school, the referral process, but they are an additional resource, the Scottish Rite Hospital. So their website is great. Let's look at the definition of dyslexia. I'm going to read this, but I want to point out a few key words. And so see if it compares to what you think dyslexia is. So dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurological in, in origin, meaning originating in the brain. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. That has to do with our ability of our brain to, he to hear sounds and manipulate sounds in our mind. That is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. So first we have to rule out that there wasn't just, you know, some subpar instruction going Par on instruction or going that, on. Kind of thing. that the child may be moved quite a bit. Maybe moved quite a bit. So we have to rule those things out. Um, secondary consequence, oh, and also typically um, students with dyslexia can have average to above average intellectual abilities and cognitive abilities. Um, students can be gifted and talented and have dyslexia as well. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. The key here is that it's a brain-based disorder um, and it's also based in deficits in phonological awareness, which we'll get to in just a second. It is not a visual impairment. Back when they were first researching dyslexia in like 1895, they called it word blindness. They thought it was a visual component. Um, Dr. Smith, we'll get to this in just a second. Who is authorized to diagnose dyslexia? And it's somebody in the school who's been trained, basically somebody who's been trained to administer the, the assessment. What do you guys think? What percent of students have dyslexia? Type your guess in the chat window. We've got wide range. Um, Dr. Brown, do you want to go ahead and, and facilitate this question? Yes. So just go ahead and type your um, estimates, and then we'll talk about some of the responses. There's, put in a guess. I see 15, 30, 15, 20, 25, 70, 32. So um, in a way, maybe not the 70, sorry, but in a way, almost all of you are correct. There is a huge um, variance in estimations of students that have dyslexia. Uh, part of that is because uh, a lot of people are not diagnosed until they're adults. They um, are just think they're slow readers and they, and they aren't always diagnosed in schools. Some of the numbers, if you just Google this, for example, I Googled it before this started, and PBS.org has a primer on dyslexia that says 17%. Um, there's a reading rockets that say um, all the that 80% of children with a reading problem is because of dyslexia, so they don't give an actual number. Um, there's one in five people, which would be 20%. There's um, from the dyslexia research institute, they have um, again, one out of every five, which is 20%. So there's numbers that can be as high as, you know, 20 or so percent, and then there's numbers that can be as low as, you know, I think Dr. Simmingson points out three and a half percent of actual diagnosis in school. So it really depends on how you're defining diagnosis. If they're in school receiving services, that's a smaller number. It's general population of people that probably have some range of dyslexia. Um, it could be as high as 20, 25 percent. 
So do you want to go ahead and yeah. move on to the next? Thanks, Dr. Brown. We just wanted to raise your awareness. You'll see different things. I, th I would go with 9%. Um, that it, var it varies, and it varies from school to school. It varies from, you know, even the community. So it just depends. The answer is it depends for that one. Um, let's turn our attention back to this idea that dyslexia involves core deficits and phonological awareness. So what is this term? A lot of people struggle to understand because the reading process is so visually oriented. When we talk about reading print text, we talk about it as a visual process. But what we're coming to know about dyslexia is it's a tr trouble with where people can't process sounds in, in their head. And so phone means sound. And being aware of hearing specific sounds, and more importantly, being able to segment or stretch out sounds is key and is a key prerequisite to the reading process. So if you're not able to hear each distinct sound and identify each distinct sound, you're going to have trouble later when you have to do that same skill when you're reading actual text. And so it involved, this skill involves hearing sounds, rhyming, alliteration, and most importantly, segmenting or stretching out the individual units of sound and words. Um, and we call this phonemic awareness, segmenting and blending phonemes. And so consequently, when students are diagnosed as having dyslexia, usually a big one indicator of the many measures that we take is um, low, low scores and phonological awareness specifically. That's going to be a red flag. If they have very high scores in phonological awareness, that's going to let us know maybe something else is going on. When we diagnose students, we're not just looking at what any one indicator. We use the multiple measures approach. And so keep that in mind. But I wanted to define this. It's this awareness of sound in our mind. We can do it with our eyes closed, so it's not a visual process. Um, here's an activity students can do to foster that sense of segmenting sounds. And it's called Elkonin boxes or sound boxes. And you just create these boxes and you, let's say you're working on words with three phonemes, like cat. And so you help them stretch out and say how many sounds in the word cat. And they count them. K, a, ch. And they move a penny up into each box for each sound. Another name for this activity is called say it and move it, where you say the word cat. And they say it, cat. And then they stretch it out. K, a, ch. And they move a penny or a token into each box for each individual sound. It's very concrete, and it's multisensory. Um, and it can also help them with spelling later, because you can ask them to write each sound in the box. It doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one match with print and sound. So for example, the word sheep. You say, what do you hear at the beginning? Shh. Which sounds do you hear in the middle? And then what do you hear at the end? So sound boxes and working on segmenting sounds can not only help with reading, but with spelling. The phonological awareness and phonemic awareness are crucial areas to develop for, and identify for students with dyslexia. So how do we identify dyslexia? Here are just a few of the indicators. These are some of the main indicators. Um, so difficulty reading real words in isolation. So for example, if you give students a list of words and you ask them to read each word, that's hard for them. It's actually easier for students to read words in the context of, say, a, a sentence or a paragraph. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's harder for students with dyslexia to read words in isolation? I mean, wouldn't it be easier if it's just one word? But the answer is that students can use meaning cues when they're reading. And they can draw on the words around the word they're reading to understand what it is. And so that can help them. In isolation, you have to really read the word. Dr. Brown says we call that context clues, yes. Um, also, another indicator is trouble decoding nonsense words, right? So if I have a word, um, and you know, let's say I have a word, and it's not a real word, and I want a student to read it, they have to really draw on those graphophonemic or phonics-based cueing systems. And so we'll really know if they know that phonics rule or pattern, and if they're able to draw on that knowledge base when they read. Dr. Seuss is not their favorite, Dr. Brown says. I can see that. 
another sign that you'll see as a classroom teacher or specialist or parent or just knowing someone that, that struggles um, is slow, inaccurate, or labored oral reading, lack of reading fluency. Fluency is a key, crucial component of the reading process. It has, think of a car. It has to go at a certain rate to get on the freeway and merge into traffic and keep up that rate. Same thing with reading. We kind of need to reach this crucial speed when we read so that we can attend to other things like understanding what we're reading or comprehension. So lack of reading fluency is another indicator. So we measure that and develop that. Um, difficulty with learning to spell. So you'll see that in their writing. So you'll see indicators in reading and in spelling and in writing. By the way, when students struggle with writing, it's called dysgraphia. And students can be dyslexic and not be dysgraphic, or they can have both. And then they can be dysgraphic and struggle with writing and maybe not have dyslexia. So sometimes they co-occur, sometimes they don't. It also can include challenges in learning the names of letters and sounds. So we test that as well. All of these are things we typically test in the kindergarten, first, and second grade as screening measures. And at, in the state of Texas, we're actually required to use screening tools in kinder, first, and second so that we can specifically look for students with dyslexia and intervene early. We really need to intervene before age eight or there's a chance that the struggles and challenges will really persist into adulthood. Phonological memory, so again, stretching out sounds, being able to say the sounds in a word is key. Rapid naming, so some of the challenges with dyslexia don't even have to do with literacy per se. They may have to do more with language broadly, or they may have to do with memory or processing. So with rapid naming, if I asked one of you to name the days of the week, you would likely say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like that, quickly. A student with dyslexia may have difficulty retrieving that information quickly and may have trouble sequencing that and getting it out quickly. And so all those things can be um, you know, facets of having dyslexia. And again, challenges with phonological awareness is probably one of the key areas in identifying dyslexia. And that's among other language components, like spelling and some of the things we talked about. I really encourage you all to read the Dyslexia Handbook to learn more about these challenges that students face. So that's just a little bit about how we know a student might have dyslexia. Dr. Brown's going to do a quick uh, mini quiz where you're going to vote in the polling area. And I'll let you take it okay. over. Okay. So if you look right beside the hand again to the right side, there is a check mark for yes and a red X for no. So if dyslexia only affects children's reading, if you feel that that's yes, click on the green check mark. If you feel that it's no, click on the green X. Good. So far, we're at 100% comprehension of that concept, <laughs> which is very good. All right. Good job. All right. OK, and um, that was false. It's not a visual problem. Challenges um, are in sequencing letters according to the way a word sounds. By the way, this, this mini quiz is called the Mythbusters quiz that Dr. Brown located. And I'm putting the link in the chat window if you want to bookmark that for later. And it's also on the Google Doc. And I think we have one more um, quick poll, Dr. Brown. So dyslexia can be cured with early intervention. So if we are able to cure dyslexia with early intervention, if you think yes, click on the green check. If you think no, click on the red X. All right. This one, I think, is actually a little bit of a trick question. Not completely, but it's the word cured. We can't actually cure dyslexia. It's a brain-based disorder. You're always going to have dyslexia, but we can um, remediate and teach children interventions that help them overcome 
of the challenges that they face with dyslexia. And the earlier that we do that, the better. So early intervention is very, very important, and it's key. But you're never going to cure someone. You can't um, go in and change the, you know, components in their brain to cure dyslexia. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Um, yeah. I'll just mention that a good book that I have listed in the handout is called Overcoming Dyslexia um, by Sally Shaywitz. She's a doctor at Yale University and does quite a bit of research and has worked quite with quite a bit of families and children. Um, that resource is, is key, and she kind of talks about some of these ideas, for instance, that children really need to be diagnosed before age eight. And so let's keep going. So yes, um, dyslexia is a genetic disorder. And so it's not something one cures. It's something one learns strategies. One learns um, to overcome deficits, but it's never cured. And so um, students that you know become adults will continue to face some of those challenges and as adults and into college. But they just learn ways to cope. For instance, to hearing books on tape. Well, we don't use tape anymore, but hearing digital books and e-books and audio books is one way to cope, but it's never cured. Um, and so, okay, so as we continue to diagnose, it's really important to know that parents are involved or guardians are involved every step of the way once it's determined that students need to be tested or formally assessed by the school. So parents are notified and formal written consent must be um, provided. Parents are also given a list of safeguards, which means you know that parents have rights here, and that they need to be notified of the entire process. They need to not be notified of any meetings that are going to take place. They need to be invited to those meetings in a very timely way. This isn't something you know. Oh, by the way, you know we're having a meeting next week about Johnny, and you're invited. It's very much of an effort to include the parents. A survey is sent ho sent home to the parents to s where the parents can provide input, like observations or strengths that they notice about their student. Because we want to take a strengths-based perspective. We see challenges, but what can we draw on? to help you know, the child in the classroom and at home. And the diagnostic tools must follow certain guidelines. So you must measure certain areas. And the person doing the data gathering can't just go off and do it. A committee has to determine, with parents involved, that the assessment needs to take place in the first place. Also, a parent can ask and request that the school diagnose their child. So it's not just always the school. Um, that's initiating this, parents often initiate and bring up, hey, I'm noticing this in my child. Can you help? What's the next step? So parents will also do that. Um, so these are the types of things we assess, things like letter knowledge, like the name of the letter and the, and the sound the letter makes, letter naming fluency, and letter sound fluency. And they need to be able to, to say those sounds and letters fairly quickly if they Look at a letter for 30 seconds, it's not very fluent in letter name and sound. They also need to be able to read real and nonsense words in isolation, so on a list, to see how their decoding skills are without context clues. We also measure their fluency, so rate of reading, and see if it's up to par with benchmarks. For instance, at the end of first grade, a first grader a benchmark is that they should be reading at 60 words correct per minute. Notice I said correct. So they're not just reading words and making a lot of errors, but the net outcome of one minute of timed reading is they're reading 60 words correctly per minute. And that's why you'll see teachers with stopwatches measuring them, measuring students' fluency scores. We also want to know their comprehension, their listening comprehension when they're read to, to see if they're understanding and to see if the decoding is really the issue or if they're not understanding even when they're read to. And then we also assess written spelling. Um, there are other components. They're not all here, but I've listed the major ones. We assess phonological and phonemic awareness, awareness of sounds and words, and things like rapid naming to see if they can name you know, and sequence things like days of the week, months of the year. Do we have any questions so far or comments? Let's see if anyone, what you all think so far. Is this in line with what you knew about dyslexia, or is it kind of new information? Let's just kind of pause for a minute. 
How are we doing so far? Allie asked a question about um, what about dyscalculia numbers? Is this a separate issue, or do people usually have both? As far as I know, it's a separate issue. But again, many of these can co-occur. And so we see, we see that students um, with dyslexia can have ADHD. And students that, are, that have dy dyslexia can have dysgraphia, but they don't necessarily go together. Um, OK, great. Let's keep moving. The referral process, uh, briefly, there's a pre-referral. It includes data gathering and observation by the classroom teacher. Most important, um, a pre-referral team discusses the student. You've got to keep track of that data in a systematic way in the classroom. Um, to, uh, Dr. Smith asked, to what extent can direct instruction mitigate dyslexia problems? That's actually a key component of the dyslexia handbook is systematic, direct, and explicit instruction. And I'll go over that. And Christina, we'll come back to your question in just a second. Um, more about the referral process. The teacher should monitor progress. Usually that's weekly. Usually weekly monitoring is something you can do to be systematic once a week. Keep collecting some literacy data, some spelling data, some reading data, some writing data so that you're collecting that. And I would keep it in a folder if it's digital or pen and paper. Um, and then there's screening tools the state will provide, like TPRI here in Texas. There are procedures that must be followed in, in the form of a flow chart for a referral process. And then the committee, ha everyone on the committee has ro identified roles. Um, let's look back at the questions. When you say dysgraphia and struggling with writing, do you mean getting thoughts on the page or quality of their writing? And Dr. Brown says, you can notice signs. It's actually a mo mo motor in control of writing. So it's not necessarily getting words and ideas down. You might be able to share words and ideas orally, but it's actually struggling with the motor control of writing. So really, um, you know, handwriting that's challenging. If you go to the YouTube playlist that I've created, we have a video with a professor of kinesiology at UTA who specializes in dysgraphia. And that video is there. So I encourage you to look on the Google um, handout for that resource. OK, Dr. Smith, this gets at your question. What are some key points to know about the types of instruction that works with students who are diagnosed with dyslexia? We know from research that usually direct, intensive, and systematic input from an interaction with the teacher works best. So the type of instruction where we turn them loose and give them a task to be done on their own and to completely independently is not the best type of instruction. We need direct instruction, so where we're providing um, information that's sort of been broken down into chunks for students, right? It's intensive, meaning you might work with a smaller group of students, maybe even one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're working with a group of students who face challenges in reading, significant challenges, you might be working with those that small group for maybe 30 minutes of intensive instruction. That has to do with pacing. That means you're not saying, OK, read for five minutes, and let's talk about your ideas when you're done. That's not intensive. Intensive is checking for understanding frequently, maybe after every sentence if students are struggling with comprehension, for instance. So the intensiveness and the pacing is a lot faster, not in terms of you know accelerated, but you're checking in more frequently. You really have to be on your toes as a teacher. And then systematic, so sequenced. So you're not going to throw something at them until they've done step one. And then you'll go to step two and step three in that task. Um, immediate feedback from the teacher. So you're monitoring their work. So if you're reading and the student is reading aloud and you, you hear you know, a breakdown or something, you might immediately give them some corrective feedback or wait till they get to the end of the sentence and say, try that again. But you're giving them some immediate feedback so they're not struggling for very long. Careful pacing. Systematic structured progression from simple to complex. And then this last one is a biggie, although I have to say there's not tons of research to support it. It's still a biggie in working with students with dyslexia, and that's multisensory instruction. What comes to mind when you hear the term multisensory instruction? I always think of touching things, tactile. So 
um, hands-on manipulatives work, and so those are helpful to students. So Allie, you asked about math. Um, if students are struggling and in that area, you might give them some manipulatives um, in that way. And same with literacy, magnetic letters, things they can touch. If they can see it on a poster, that helps. The visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, and the tactile are crucial. So here's an example. A friend of mine in Austin who was a reading specialist um, has this website, boostforreaders.com, and it, she designed it for first graders, but she's got some clever things. So the B and the D, if they mix those up, um, she has this poster called Mr. Beady Eyes. And she also has, I've heard, you know, you can say, put on your glasses, and then there's the B, and then there's the D. I don't know if I did that right. Put on your glasses, B and D, right? And it's called Mr. Beady Eyes, and I like that. So that's an example of the multisensory, right? So visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile. And this, in this way, it's mainly visual. So here are some more examples of multisensory instruction. So salt and sand tray for letters and sounds. So you can get a cookie sheet or a, sh a shallow baking pan and put some salt or sand in it. We don't have that much sand here in this area, so I would use salt. And then as you are learning the letters and sounds, let's say you're learning the ch diagraph. So you could trace C and H into the salt tray and say C, H, ch, and then pass the salt tray to the next student and have them trace the letters in the sand. It's like if you've been to the beach and you trace it on the sand, you can see it and you can feel it with your finger. And it's, it's fun, too. So that's one way that let, literacy learning can be multisensory. I've seen sandpaper letters. Jennifer says, um, somebody says shaving cream. Yeah, and, and that's another technique for multisensory. Put a little shaving cream on the desk, kind of spread it around, and then the student can trace it in it so they can see it, feel it, um, say it, and hear it, multisensory. Sandpaper letters, you can buy those at the teacher store. Um, you might just Google uh, multisensory literacy instruction. If you're on Pinterest, you might look and see if there's visuals that you can look at for multisensory literacy instruction. Skywriting, so students have to stand up for this, and so they literally trace the letter in the, in the air, so you go A. Ah, and they trace it in big letters. There's, well, they're not tracing, they're writing. They're writing in the air. And so sky writing is a neat way for kids to really get, you know, their bodies involved, to be kinesthetic. It puts the K in V-A-K-T. So know that this is a great technique, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, tactile, for working with students with dyslexia. Um, something like the YMCA dance, uh-huh, <laughs> getting your body involved. And it's great for all students. No one likes to just sit in school. Um, so there are so many endless examples that I don't have time to talk about, but that you can explore further on your own, of using technology and mobile tools to enhance learning and literacy for students that, that struggle. So one example is, um, and it's local, it's called Reading and Radio Resource. And I learned about this through Pete Smith here at, at UTA. And so if you click there, they do audiobooks. And I think they're mostly digital. It used to be, you know, books on cassette and reel to reel. And now we're 21st century, and there are so many um, digital books and audiobooks out there. And when you can hear, the story being read to you that frees you up, that frees up a student from having to devote so much time to reading something. So that's one example of a tool um, and that kind of thing. Ali says you can get them from the library for free also. Audiobooks, right, exactly. Re I think reading and radio resource specifically work with schools too to work with specific books to help provide more resources. So more on that in a minute. So modifications, students can use highlighters, large print text, assistive technology. One key modification is just more time. So students can receive more time to take a test, especially a standardized test. Another one, especially on standardized testing, is have someone read part of the test to them. So for instance, in math, they might read the math problems out loud to them to, to let them really work on the math part. And Dr. Brown says it's especially important when the content is focused, not their reading speed, and that's giving them extra time. Good. Um, so even more, one-on-one, -on -one, small group, sit in front of class, less distractions, 
there are tons of modifications out there. These are just ones that I've seen over and over. Longer testing time, more breaks, breakup assessment into chunks, and that helps with attention and being able to focus because it can be exhausting spending all your time decoding. Format, so like audio, this is more for instruction, not for assessment, but audiobooks, ebooks, listening while reading. There are apps where the book, where you, you can have it read to you on the Kindle or iPad, um, oral or read to you, repeated directions, or you might give verbal directions and written directions. Um, and then also use systematic sequential directions. Not too many at a time. Have you ever get, been given directions and they tell you like 10 things and you're like, wait, what was the first thing again? It's like that. Be, you know, keep them short and sweet with your directions. Repeat them if needed. Write them on the board. Um, oh, good point. Someone brought up a great point. Many of these look like they would be effective with ADD, ADHD as well. And because there are co-occurrences of both, it's good to use these. Whatever works for the student. And actually, when students are diagnosed, you come up with a list of modifications that you actually need to use. That is good practice for all young students. And then agreed. Good, good comments. These are some more general tips. And then I'm going to ask you all what you think of these. So build on student strengths. Is the child or student, um, whether kindergarten or college aged, are they an artist? Can they do a visual depiction of what they're learning? Can they create a concept map? Is there an alternative assignment they can create? Can they make a video? You know, and that kind of thing. Think of all the famous artists and CEOs who have dyslexia and have become famous and successful in their life. And, you know, they did it despite having that. They built on their strengths. And so I think this one is key. And it's not to overlook their challenges, but it's to really focus on what what can what can they do, not what can't they do. Um, and Dr. Smith says, how can intervention for dyslexia be incorporated into RTI? And I'll get to that in a second at the end. Don't let me forget. Um, also, teach students to self-advocate. So if they can't see or if they need directions repeated, that they feel OK to raise their hand and ask for that, or to talk to the teacher when there's a moment for one-on-one -on -one and, and ask for help when needed. Um, again, multisensory aids and a few more examples. Kids in the elementary grades may still struggle with the alphabet, so having that ABC strip on their own desk, even in the upper grades, can help with spelling. Handouts, so if you're doing writing, give them, even upper grade kids, a list of sight words that they, they can use for their writing, so they're, that frees up their time from having to think about those sight words, which they may still be struggling with. So I, give, I gave my kids tons of handouts, and they stapled them in the front of their notebook or kept them in their desk or binder or whatever. Um, they can use computers and use desktop printing instead digital assignments as opposed to handwritten. And I think we all know about that one. And keep track of student progress. What do you think about these tips? Which one of these appeals to you most? Go ahead and type that in the chat window. What are your thoughts? So we've got strengths, self-advocacy, breaking it up into chunks, multi-sensory aids. We had some back here, too. What do you think about the tips? Dr. Brown says, limit what they have to copy for themselves off the board, et cetera. Strengths. OK, I like the strengths one. Two, I like resources. I think the more you can provide resources for people, the better. And then they can make use of those as needed without having to raise their hand all the time and ask you, how do you spell this? And how do you spell that? And so on. OK, good. Chunking, assignments, word wall. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Good, good idea, Dr. Brown. Again, technology can be a best resource for students who struggle and face challenges. And we call that assistive technology. And there are, just, there are so many interesting tools out there. Um, again, recording for the blind and dyslexic is one. There are apps and digital books. So one thing you can do is um, speech-to-text software. So you can even try this on your phone. I encourage you all to download Dragon Dictation if you don't already have it. And you can use this in your own lives. And you can dictate a note, and it types it out for you. Um, Kathy says, during the film, there was mention of drawing pictures for taking notes. Yeah, excellent. That's excellent. So the visual versus the verbal. 
But speech to text is really great. These are just two examples of talking and it and it does the text for you. What do you guys think about these? Have you used Dragon? Any thoughts on these? Thanks for connecting back to the film for us, Kathy, too. That's great. And then also, um, this kind of piggybacks off what Kathy was just writing in the chat window. This idea of concept mapping. This is a tool called Toplet. And so students can create a visual. I, I borrowed this from their website. It was one of their examples. And so you have a visual, and you can type and color code. And you can add images and video, so it's multimodal. Allie, how do you use concept maps in math? Because that's intriguing, too. Um, so students can see at a glance and get the bigger picture. Other concept mapping tools, Bubble Us, Inspiration, Kidspiration. And again, the one I just shared was poplet.com. So you can create a few free ones, and then it charges you. You can also use visual scaffolding, like a visual thesaurus, and it shows how words are related to other words. I think that's all we have time for now. That, those were just some main ideas. We really encourage you to look at resources. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown, and she's going to wrap up and talk about, a little bit about resources. OK, so as um, Dr. Simmingson said, there's endless numbers of resources that we don't have time to go into. But some of the most common ones, um, if you look at the International Dyslexia Association, they are going to have lots of resources for teachers and for parents. And you know, it's really important that you provide these resources for parents as well, because they will want to learn how to support their, their child's reading at home. Um, reading Rockets is a great resource for it has information, but it also has concrete ideas and activities and things you can do. Um, and then, of course, the Dyslexia Handbook um, in Texas, that is our number one resource. That is what um, you will be required to read and implement the, um, the things in that handbook, because they pertain to the laws related to Dyslexia for Texas. Then do you want to? advance the slide here. OK. <laughs> and then be sure and look for, I mean, if you just Google Dyslexia resources, you can find all sorts of websites, books, apps, um, you know, different things, and, and share those. And so you know, if you have a question or if you are wondering, oh, my, how might that work, you know, be sure and continue learning on your own. Every child is going to be different, and so what works for one child may not necessarily be the best thing to work for another. So I think we know that um, we have to keep keep learning. So if you have some uh, ways that you plan to learn on your own, go ahead and tap those in the chat window. Um, if you have other resources that you've heard about that we didn't mention that you found really um, important, you can tap those in the chat window. Um, and I see that some of your color sheets are something that used to be thought to be very helpful because it was, that was when dyslexia was thought to be simply a visual problem. Um, now that we understand that it is you know, a brain-based auditory issue, the color sheets aren't advocated. Now, color sheets are useful in keeping a child's attention focused on a page. Sometimes just having a different colored sheet can help maybe draw their attention. But you also have to think about the contrast and the print to the background. And sometimes color sheets can um, be difficult to read because the contrast isn't great enough. All right, so overlays, like I said, those were some of the things that used to be um, really advocated that now it's more of an attention focusing activity versus actually helping the the sounds and the differences in sounds that a dyslexic child will struggle with. All right. Let's go to the next. Oh, you okay. Um, social media. There is a lot on social media in, that you can go to. You can find information. You can follow these sites and um, you know when they post new ideas 
There are also some other teacher sites um, that you can follow, especially like on Facebook or Twitter, that you can ask questions and other teachers can, will post answers. So if you aren't familiar with some of those, these are a couple that um, Dr. Simmingson has, has put up here. Pinterest, again, is another site that you can find maybe more ideas than maybe you'll get an idea overload on Pinterest, but <laughs> it's a really great way to find new ideas, and especially if something hasn't, you know, the way that you've been doing something isn't working and you want to find a way to tweak it a little bit, Pinterest is a great site for doing that, and teachers love to share their ideas, and so there is, you know, millions of ideas out on Pinterest for different teaching-related subjects. All right. And here's some of the references. Um, Dr. Simmingson mentioned uh, these books that are great resources and the link to the Dyslexia Handbook. All right. Do you want to follow up sure. with the, yeah. um, the questions? Or do you want me to? Yeah, okay. tell us some, type in the chat window something you learned, a word, a phrase, information that stood out. What do you keep hoping to explore? What do you want to know more about? If you have a resource you want to share, you can type that in there too. So we'd love to hear from you. We shared some, some key ideas, but there's so much more to learn. So what are you thinking? Go ahead and take a minute to type in the chat window. I hope to explore. I learned. I want to know. Really, the, the idea that you're, you're focusing on the key elements of phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency. You're doing those in intensive ways. You're using multi-sensory instruction. You're building on student strengths. Those are all key ideas in working with students with dyslexia. Christopher says, I'd like to know some strategies for identifying dyslexia in an online college algebra course. Um, you might look at things like spelling. Sometimes with online instruction, you only see the written, right? Because you don't speak to them. And you, you may ask the student, um, you might ask students, how long is it taking you to read through the, the problems? And as, if they're saying, man, my homework's taking three hours, instead of 20 minutes, you know, then you may, know, you, you can infer, um, Christopher, that maybe there's an issue. And so a lot of times all of this is making inferences if you really think about it, because as much as we do with MRIs and, you know, there isn't something in the brain that says, you know, this student has dyslexia, so we're looking for multiple cues or things. And so in your case with online, I would look at the writing and the spelling and things like that and maybe ask students how long assignments are taking them and that kind of thing. And strategies might include, um, you know, look, helping students look for keywords in problems, helping students to work through the readings a little quicker, maybe by reducing the amount of reading. Something else that I haven't mentioned is you can give students advance advanced organizers, and this works well at the college level, so where I give you a one-page kind of Cliff Notes version of what it is you're using. So if you're tutoring a student and you just get a, a, a one-page summary of all the key ideas, that can help people not be overwhelmed. Um, and Carol asks, what are some public te tests that should be given to diagnose dyslexia? Um, and that is, you know, there are many norm reference tests that are typically given, but usually you can just give basic one-minute timed fluency tests, um, letter sound, you know, relationship. One that's used is, is the Dibbles test, and I just typed in Dibbles too, at the same time Dr. Brown. The TPRI is a screening tool that's used. Um, but to do a more in-depth assessment, you know, it really varies according to which actual tools are used. And so you might want to take a look at the dyslexia handbook to see the variety of tests that are given. But there, m many of them are just sort of day-to-day -day classroom types of assessments, like letter sound relationship information. Um, and Kathy says, OK, graphic novels. OK. Um, and then we've got some more comments about things, strategies for older students. Another thing you can do is have students um, read high interest, low readability books. And so they're books that are interesting, but they're written at a kind of a lower reading level. 
find out what they're interested in, and then match um, the reading level with where they're at so they feel confident and they're building fluency and they're not getting frustrated. Dr. Brown says audiobooks. You've tried some, many are still the, then um, Christina, just, you're going to have to just find out what the instructional, what the reading level is where it's not frustrating and find books that match that level best, even if you have to kind of go down a level of, of where the, the student, you know, should be, you know, find books that match. And a literacy um, teacher, language arts teacher, is always matching the right text with the student. Um, you might look into nonfiction text as well. Nonfiction text is always a, um, a little more interesting, I think. Novels and books are good too, but nonfiction text can really engage, and you can get at books that are at a different level. Um, let's see, regarding ESL students and testing for reading. Um, that's actually an added complexity. So if students speak another language, you've got to kind of test them in both languages. And you've got to determine which language is the home language and what, you know, and that sort of thing. And so that, that adds layers of complexity. You have to rule out whether it's a language, second language acquisition issue or if it's an underlying um, issue with dyslexia. I'm, I'm reading through your, through your scenario, Jennifer. Um, let's see, capable of communicating, reading and writing, difference between ESL. You know, it's, it's trickier. I'll, I'm just going to answer shortly. It's a lot trickier. Generally, you have to look at the big picture. As with all diagnosis of dyslexia, you never just look at two or three measures and say, well, that's it. That's your issue. You have to look at the big picture. So you take into consideration length of, of time that student arrived, length of time of instruction, you know, quality of instruction the student has received. Another issue is when students move a lot, so they haven't received consistent instruction. Is that the issue? These are things a committee determines in looking at the big picture. So I would say you have to kind of look at the big picture in that. And then finally, we have a question. Do you suggest Orton-Gillingham approach? That's a multi-sensory type of approach. And um, most schools use that in, t in terms of what works. And let me just finally say, all dyslexia instruction um, has to be evidence-based and research-based according to the dyslexia handbook. So it, you've got to kind of follow guidelines about what is research-based literacy instruction. Um, okay, good. That's kind of all we have time for. Dr. Brown, do you want to do this, one of these last final slides? We want to hear from you all what are good topics for future webinars. Right. Um, we're planning for fall and spring, and we want to know from you what topics you're interested in. Are there a specific topic that you want to learn more about that you feel Especially for those, I know mean, there were a couple of you that were recent graduates. Is there something that as you got into the classroom you thought, wow, I really wish I knew a little bit more about this and you think would be really beneficial for our upcoming students? Um, just type that in the chat window and we will investigate including that in a future webinar. So then the last couple of slides. If you if you um, are interested, we do have a little plug here from our Mind Brain Education Master's degree, and this is some information about the courses that are included. It really focuses on that intersection between education and cognitive science, and so it's a very, very interesting master's, and like I said, if you um, are interested in that, you can contact, it's on the next slide. Um, Mark Schwartz, and he will be able to give you all the information about that. And I think that's the last, is this the last slide? Yes. It is. And this is where you can participate and, um, you know, and be sure to participate in future webinars. I see some of the, the things that are coming up is autism that's come up a couple of times, the extreme classroom management, um, you know, not the normal here's the rules, here's how you set up your classroom, but kind of when you have to have a behavior intervention, is that what I'm um, understanding? And then specifically, uh, let's see, I'm scrolling back down. <laughs> 
project-based learning. I love project-based learning and um, actually got to go to a seminar by uh, Lillian Katz, who kind of is the guru of project-based learning. So that's something that we could definitely look at doing in the future. All right. Well, thank you. Do you have any last words, Dr. Simmons? No. I just wanted to let everyone know, be sure and share our handout, because it, uh, shortly, within 30 minutes or an hour, I will post the link to this recording, and you'll be able to access that.